Councillor Lafferty, Councillor Devlin and Councillor Wallace. OK, thank you very much. And any declarations of interest from anybody present? No. OK, fine. So if we just uh, mention the people attending today, so from Police Scotland with Chief Superintendent Mark Sutherland, who's our divisional commander uh, for Greater Glasgow, and Chief Inspector Alan Gray, who's the area commander for East Renfrewshire. Uh, we also have, I think we also have Inspector Michelle Grant, who's observing today, and Michelle, sorry, Inspector Grant is our local communities inspector. And from Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, we have Alan Coftry, the Group Commander for East Renfrewshire. And we also have the uh, Area Commander, I think, from uh, uh, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. At this point, I'd also like to introduce Stephen Bell, an absentee manager, who is uh, our Community Safety Manager. Unfortunately, Stephen couldn't make today's cabinet due to a prior engagement. But Stephen has joined us from South Lanarkshire Council, where he was a security manager for a number of years. And Stephen also has a background in the police over in Tayside. So with those introductions, can we move on to the uh, police report? And I'll pass over to Chief Superintendent Sullivan. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, and good morning to um, everybody, and thanks for taking the time to, to join us on this important uh, Cabinet meeting this morning. Um, the first thing I suppose I would like to do is, is formally record my thanks to um, Chief Inspector Brian McGeer, um, who, and along with Inspector Stevie Scott, who a lot of you will know well and, and, and enjoyed working uh, with them during their time in East Renfrewshire, and at the same time, uh, take the opportunity to introduce um, the new team in East Renfrewshire. I'm seeing you, they've been in for a, a number of months now, but this is the first time that they are coming and representing um, the East Renfrewshire um, um, policing community. Um, and obviously you've already introduced them as Chief Inspector Alan Gray and Inspector Michelle Grant, um, both of whom have a wealth of, of different policing experiences, which I think will provide great value um, to, to East Renfrewshire. Uh, Michelle knows the East Renfrewshire community very well, uh, and, and Alan is, is already up to speed um, with uh, the, the, the kind of different needs and challenges of the East Renfrewshire community. Um, as a divisional commander, uh, I can provide some assurance that I am very careful uh, about who um, goes into East Renfrewshire, uh, and, and Alan and Michelle have my uh, full support, and I have no doubt will do a very good job um, for East Renfrewshire and the communities that we serve. Um, in terms of the, the report, this is the quarter four report, which brings an end uh, to the previous financial year. Um, I don't think it, you really need me to say how, how different and challenging a year um, that, that, that this has been uh, in terms of policing performance. And, and, and actually, not only has it been exceptionally difficult to police, it's actually very difficult for, for members of the cabinet to actually scrutinise police performance in, in what is such a, a unique year. Um, we have definitely had a different um, set of tests and a different set of pressures um, on us um, from a policing perspective um, over the, the four quarters of, of, um, of the year presented in this report. And those continue, unfortunately, as um, Councillor Grant was quite rightly stating, you know, I hope that we're all back in, in, in person uh, in, in, in the near future and, and who knows, maybe even the next, uh, the next meeting. Um, but in, uh, in other ways, it looks like we're a way off uh, in terms of that at, at the moment. And so, of course, the, the figures that we're presenting this year um, are, are very, very unique in terms of the way that they look and that we have seen um, violence generally coming coming down significantly. We've seen some elements of acquisitive crime, particularly those round about house, um, house breaking and, and domestic crime coming down. But other areas have been more challenging to try and um, to, to make sure that we are providing a good police um, performance and a good police um, service round about protecting vulnerable people and um, some areas of hate crime and Chief Inspector Gray will come on to those in more detail within the report. I think what has been important from, for me as the Division Commander for, for Greater Glasgow and East Renfrewshire and indeed from, from those above me is to make sure that we have continued to provide a good professional policing service that is balanced and proportionate as we have um, sought to use the new powers that we have under the coronavirus regulations in a proportionate and an effective way. 
a very difficult role for the police to make sure that we play our part in terms of managing the pandemic um, and using the powers that we have to try and maintain effectively safe lives and to keep cases down. But at the same time, we need to maintain that public trust and confidence, that policing by consent as we as we move forward. And I, and I, I think we've just about got that right. Not on all, all occasions, of course. But I think over the piece, when you look at um, the, the public satisfaction rates that we have in East Renfrewshire, um, they, have they have maintained a good level uh, and shows that we're using those powers um, correctly. Um, in terms of um, the policing plan that we have for East Renfrewshire, obviously our local priorities continue to be both crime and protecting um, vulnerable people. And there has been some challenges around about protecting vulnerable people through the pandemic. Um, more people spending more time at home, um, public services that are delivered um, by partner agencies and third sector being delivered in a different way, uh, as have policing services as we've tried to deal with more things um, um, by way of a resolution not in person. And all of these have a drip effect on, on how we um, manage and, and support and protect vulnerable people. In terms of um, what we're doing in a more strategic perspective from the division, um, we have been redesigning um, our public protection uh, unit um, and, and to try and make sure that we are focusing on um, our forensic opportunities. Um, we are trying to provide more support to victims who are um, reporting non-recent um, sexual crime um, with a dedicated team to that. Uh, and in terms of capacity, which I think has been the issue, which has, has affected um, some of our detection rates across Greater Glasgow for sexual crime, um, we have redesigned our shift pattern to increase um, our capacity during the core hours of, of day business when we are better in a position to support victims and work with partners um, to improve how we support vulnerable people. And from a crime perspective, just a couple of things I would want to, to mention. Um, um, one um, being our uh, consultation, which is out at the moment for body worn video, something that I am hugely supportive of um, as a divisional commander. Um, something that we see routinely from everything from people in car washes to uh, all sorts of other services using body worn video at events, policing at events, etc. Security guards. So, um, something that I think um, should actually increase um, public confidence in, in due course. Uh, and certainly um, is no attempt for, for, for a, big brother, a big brother nation. Um, in terms of fraud, um, we know that fraud has been a, an issue for us across a number of, as a growing trend, and I think that will continue. Um, within the division, we have now introduced our own economic crime unit, um, which will um, pr provide us some um, expert um, capability and capacity to look at fraud. I don't think that will bring um, fraud down uh, in terms of its trajectory, in terms of the demand that it puts on policing services. But what I hope from it is that it will um, professionalise our response um, to fraud and economic crime, allow us to support victims in a better way and to increase our partnership working with a division in terms of how we tackle um, fraud and economic crime. And the final thing, um, and one that, that I may, if I may come back to um, to the next cabinet with a presentation on, is that we are very much changing our approach within Greater Glasgow to be more focused on public health. And, and we have a very um, well-developed public health approach um, to policing. This has been formulated in partnership with um, Glasgow um, City Council. Uh, and over the next three months, um, both myself and Superintendent Iansen um, are keen to, to move that into the wider um, Greater Glasgow area um, in East Renfrewshire and Eastern Bartonshire. Um, I think only by working in partnership and tackling the core um, roots of public health, and um, for us particularly around about um, mental health and drug addiction, can we collectively improve the outcomes um, of some of the more vulnerable of our communities? Um, and of course, in due course, that will have a positive impact on police and demand and allow us to reallocate capacity into, uh, into other prevention um, projects. And so looking forward, um, we are already seeing a return to normal policing demand. Um, it's something that um, unfortunately we are in the throes of, of, of what we would um, class as pre-pandemic um, policing demand. Uh, at the same time, where there's still an ask of Police Scotland to rightly uh, play its part in terms of the coronavirus regulations. Um, so that's going to be a challenge for us. And we can see that um, parades and events um, are already um, 
back uh, open as well. And we have a number of notifications for parades and processions and events across Greater Glasgow, and some of them will be within East Renfrewshire or will affect the policing capacity within East Renfrewshire. And um, so my, um, my commitment uh, continues with that. And the pandemic, of course, who knows what that brings to us next? Um, in some ways, it looks like we're in a bit of a third wave and, and a battle of vaccine versus versus cases versus hospital hospitalizations, which you guys are all acutely aware of, and, and we continue to, to be committed uh, to playing our role within the, the collective um, public health and partnership approach uh, to the pandemic. So that concludes uh, my introduction. I see there's, there's a hand up from Councillor Grant Chair. I'll put it to yourself whether you want me to answer now or pass on to Chief Inspector Gray and, and, and take questions at the end. So thank you for listening. I'm happy to wait till the presentations are finished. Okay, mine, is a very, mine, mine is a very general point, so I'll just wait till we've heard it all. Okay, thank you very much for your introduction, Chief Superintendent, and we'll, we'll move on to the report. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for your introduction. Um, can I firstly introduce one of my colleagues from Police Scotland, whom you've kindly agreed um, to be an observer today? That's Detective Superintendent Craig Willison from our Crime Division. Unfortunately, Inspector Michelle Grant is currently dealing with an operational matter and cannot join at this stage. I'm delighted to be the new local police commander for East Renfrewshire and to have the opportunity to present this policing update for the fourth quarter and end of the financial year 2021. This update directly relates to East Renfrewshire policing plan for 2020-23 and highlights those areas of most concern to our communities. It emphasises our, con our continuing commitment to address those concerns and to actively engage with partners to do so through established forums within East Renfrewshire across all sectors as we collectively continue to deliver key services. I'll make references, as the Commander has at various stages, to the specific challenges which the COVID pandemic has presented through the fourth quarter and across all of 2021 reporting period, which has seen various flexes of restrictions affecting the normal daily life of our residents. These challenges have continued into the current financial year, adding complexities to our daily policing operations. In quarter four, as restrictions flexed and relaxed following the festive period, we gradually saw an increase in youth disorder in some parts of the local authority, with a number of high-profile incidents receiving both traditional and social media attention. We worked and continue to work closely with partners in this area to deliver a multi-agency response, understanding all partners' needs in this area. This includes a collective desire for positive engagement with our local young people, which I recall was a sentiment shared by members at the last meeting of Cabinet. Finally, in attending as a guest at the last meeting of Cabinet, I also noted and appreciated members' concerns for the welfare of, of our officers working through the pandemic. As members may have seen through recent media reports across the country, assaults upon police officers have increased through our COVID response. Thankfully, such incidents have been rare in East Renfrewshire, and I am pleased to report that we have today continued to see low levels of officer absence locally, supported in no small measure to their adherence to and in support of numerous COVID-specific safe working procedures which we have implemented. This report highlights challenges, positive outcomes and good work carried out in the fourth quarter of the year as we progress in the new financial year. I will firstly turn to public protection. And members will see that whilst the number of sexual crimes reported was down from 141 to 111 over the last year, and this pattern was evident through each quarter of 2020-21, this gap narrowed through quarter three and quarter four at the close of the financial year and was closer to the previous five-year average of 116 for such offences. Associated detection rates for the period were also slightly down from 36.9% to 32.4%, and this will continue to be a focus for our scrutiny moving forwards with the support of public protection unit colleagues. Whilst the reduction in number of sexual crimes is welcome, we continue to work with partner agencies to provide support to victims so they have the confidence to come forward and report ongoing and historical incidents. East Ren is part of the Nish Staff Clyde Joint Child Interview Team Pilot. Police and social work partners are co-located at Osprey House, utilising the Scottish Child Interview Model, and are encouragingly reporting the high rates of disclosure from children under this new approach. Recent social media messaging via the East Ren Police Twitter account has encouraged parents and guardians to follow guidance to improve their knowledge and understanding of their children's online activity. 
although not reported statistically within the report, and again, in line with what the commander uh, referred to as our public health approach to policing, we continue to work closely with partners, particularly in East Strand Health and Social Care and our Concern Hub, to identify and share information to direct appropriate support to vulnerable members of our communities for conditions ranging from physical disabilities to mental health issues and conditions such as dementia and PTSD. We also continue to actively work with carers to promote use of the Herbert protocol where appropriate in response to reporting misses episodes where dementia-related conditions are identified. Moving on to violent crime, we remain committed to reducing and preventing violent crime and I'm pleased to report that there has been an overall reduction in the number of assaults compared to last year. While serious assaults increased from by four to 29, which was also a slight increase on the five-year average of 26, common assaults reduced by 16.4% from 438 down to 368. Detection rates for both serious and common assaults improved from the previous year. Robberies remain static and low in number. However, at 11, however, detection rates improved significantly from 45.5% to 81.85%. However, with very small numbers, these figures can obviously very easily be skewed. We are committed to dealing quickly and effectively with incidents of domestic abuse. Whilst the number of domestic abuse crimes remained relatively static, 498 v 505 from the previous year, the number of domestic abuse crimes recorded reduced from 337 to 287, which is closer to the five-year average of 291. Detection rates from domestic abuse crimes markedly increased from 55% to 66.6%. There is considerable governance and scrutiny of these instances. The Domestic Abuse Safeguarding Unit is responsible for reviewing all domestic incidents which happen overnight within Greater Glasgow Division. On reviewing these incidents, they will make assessments for victim contact, referring high-risk victims and perpetrators to appropriate multi-agency forums, and also consider applications for the Disclosure Scheme for Domestic Abuse Scotland. Ongoing investigations are also scrutinised by local management on a daily basis to ensure all avenues of inquiry are pursued and support and updates provided to victims. Compliance with domestic bail conditions are also actively investigated by our local problem solving team. We are also actively engaged with partners locally via forums such as the East Rend Violence Against Women Partnership Group. Social media messaging via the East Rend Police Twitter account has recently promoted domestic abuse via all mediums, including online facility and via third parties. In relation to drug dealing and misuse, targeting individuals who are involved in the supply of controlled drugs is part of our public health approach to policing in East Rain. In spite of COVID impacts, which curtailed some proactivity in this area, the number of reports submitted to the Procurator Fiscal for persons involving in the supply, production and cultivation of drugs has increased by 3 to 24, although this was down on the five-year average of 32. This is an area where we aim to focus improvements. We also continue to work closely with partners within the East Rhine Alcohol and Drugs Partnership Group to support work to identify and divert those who have existing drug dependencies to better life choices and to help identify instances of near fatal overdose to ensure appropriate support can quickly be offered from health and social care colleagues. With regard to acquisitive crime, as the commander stated, the number of domestic housebreakings fell from 76 to 59 compared to last year. This is also significantly down against the five-year average of 116. With less people holidaying abroad and more people working from home through the pandemic, these figures are not unexpected. This is an area, however, where we will continue to closely monitor in order to quickly identify and respond to any emerging trends. Ensuring our officers have sound forensic awareness and maximising the use of specialist support from our scene examiners and community investigation unit will continue to be important factors moving forwards in order to, to support the detection of offenders where such crimes are committed. Proactively, we continue to support individuals, businesses and other local organisations via crime prevention survey visits from trained local officers and colleagues in Greater Glasgow Partnerships. Fraud, as the commander stated, in particular online fraud, has been increasing force-wide throughout the pandemic and is no different in East Renfrewshire. 
in addition to the establishment of a new economic crime unit within Greater Glasgow Division, proactive work locally in this area has included introduction of a fortnightly meeting between our local authority liaison officer, which I refer to as LELO, and East Rend Trading Standards to discuss trends, emerging issues, identify preventative action plans and individuals requiring preventative support. This has been adopted as best practice across Greater Glasgow Division. Voucher Scam, a joint action plan, was conducted with trading standards to raise awareness of an increasing scam with calls directing victims to purchase various vouchers such as Amazon and iTunes. Our LELO and trading standard reps attended all retailers in East Renfrewshire selling these vouchers to raise awareness of the scam and provide literature to staff display so staff are aware of the concerns. Paysafe, a uh, scam identified where victims were requested to utilise the Paysafe system to make payments to frosters. The issue was raised with Trading Standards colleagues who contacted all retailers in East Renfrewshire providing this service to raise awareness. Funding was also secured with Trading Standards to procure more scam advice booklets, which will be available in various locations throughout East Renfrewshire. We also actively use our, use, our social media account to engage with and engage with local media to highlight emerging issues and trends in the area to warn against also the use of traditional bogus crime activities. In terms of antisocial behaviour and disorders, members will have seen through each quarter's report that antisocial behaviour calls have significantly increased throughout the last year and Q4 was no different. It must be borne in mind, however, a significant number of new COVID-related matters recorded under this categorisation relating to alleged COVID social distancing breaches, alleged house parties, indoor and outdoor gatherings, travel regulation breaches as well. Notwithstanding this effect, the report of antisocial behaviour remain above the five-year average in this area, with noise complaints also increasing. Crimes of vandalism, however, were down from 385 to 334, a drop of 13.2%. Members may have seen what has been referred to as COVID fatigue effect, reduction in tolerance, recently reported in a BBC article, 10 ways that policing and crime have been changed by COVID. Close links and data exchange with East Rend community safety colleagues have been progressed by our weekly GRIP meeting, which have supported shared situational awareness of local crime trends and positive COVID infection rates, which have not always correlated. The link between youth disorder and antisocial behaviour has been an area of particular attention, with increases in reports noted following the relaxation of restrictions through the early stages of Q4, with a number of high-profile incidents attracting media attention across the local authority area. Work was progressed with partners to establish a weekly tasking meeting to proactively plan to address these matters. A proposal was recently accepted by the chair of the Safe East Ren Group to implement a joint summer action plan as a critical activity to address antisocial behaviour and youth disorder. This will formalise and build on existing partnership working with East Ren Council, community safety wardens, youth workers and British Transport Police and bring in other partners such as Scottish Fire and Rescue and Scottish Water as required over a summer where it is anticipated that many members of our communities will be staying at home and seeking to safely enjoy East Rain's many parks and open spaces. This plan will include a public communication strategy, including messaging from education to parents of senior school pupils across East Rain high schools, alerting parents to the inherent dangers of not only alcohol consumption, but the locations which some of our young people frequent to gather, for example, disused quarries and reservoirs. There will also be engagement with elected members prior to the public launch. Moving on to the second page of the report, I would wish to highlight some of the excellent work carried out by our officers across the broad range of their duties. Regarding our focus on violent crime, in late February, a 15-year-old male youth was the victim of a targeted attack where he sustained a multiple stab wounds to his torso, chest and arms in the Thornley Bank Road area near to Thornley Bank Railway Station. Response officers on routine patrol came across this victim as the perpetrators made off. They carried out emergency life-saving first aid whilst awaiting the attendance of Scottish Ambulance colleagues who had to carry out an open chest procedure at the locus in order to save the victim's life. Following two inquiry, two males aged 15 and 16 years were charged with attempted murder. Without the prompt action of our officers involved, it was the opinion of ambulance uh, paramedics that the victim would have succumbed to his injuries, and these officers will accordingly be nominated for recognition awards. In terms of our focus on drug supply and misuse, 
In February, one of her campus officers identified suspicious activity near to one of her local high schools. Assisted by other uniformed officers and supported by East Rain Council CCTV colleagues, three male suspects were identified and a quantity of herbal cannabis was recovered. A 17-year-old male was charged with multiple offences, including being concerned in the supply of drugs. In relation to our focus on crimes of dishonesty, between December and March, four crimes were reported by elderly residents in the Gifnick and Clarkson area who were victims of crime of fraud and attempted fraud. Two victims lost a total of more than £5,000. Through robust investigation by response and local problem-solving team officers, a 22-year-old man was charged with these crimes. Our focus on vulnerable road users saw a total of 55 drivers charged through the year with driving whilst under the influence of drink and or drugs. This marks a 10% increase in detections from the previous year. Trained officers from our roads policing unit now regularly provide assistance to local officers to carry out roadside drug wipe tests, which can identify drivers who may be driving whilst under the influence of drugs. This is a welcome and effective development to a range of tactics being deployed to ensure the safety of all our road users. Regarding our focus on domestic abuse, and adult protection, the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2018 has enabled police to deal more effectively with different types of domestic abuse, including coercive control. In January, a 52-year-old man was charged with a contravention of Section 1 of the Act in relation to an ongoing campaign of verbal, physical and emotional abuse of his partner. In early March, an 18-year-old male was identified for indecently exposing himself to a 75-year-old woman in the Gifnick area. He was arrested and apprehended at court, where he was released with specific bail conditions, including a curfew. In terms of our focus on young people, as previously detailed through quarter four, we experienced increasing levels of reported youth disorder. In early March, a significant incident occurred in Busby Road, Clarkston, where officers came under a sustained attack by a large number of youths, many of whom were under the influence of alcohol. The extent of the attack necessitated two youths being sprayed with incapacitant spray. Drugs and a knife were recovered from the locus. The safety of our officers is paramount, and as the divisional commander has stated, the force's current public consultation around the use of body-worn video cameras, which members of the cabinet will be aware of, details this aspect as a key rationale for wider rollout of this technology. The strong relationship that our campus officers have with pupils in East Renfrewshire High Schools has played a large part in ensuring we are able to deal robustly and effectively with emerging issues. During the lockdown period, when school closures were in place, campus officers were frequently deployed on late shift duties, in particular at weekends when issues were frequently occurring. Their presence at key locations and times enabled them to undertake positive interactions with young people when they were found congregating. The 4 E's approach adopted during the COVID response will continue to be central to our engagement with young people as we progress through the next phases of the pandemic and beyond. Chair, thank you again for the opportunity to present this report. This concludes my review and I'm happy to take any questions from yourself or other members. You're on mute. You're on mute. After all this time, and so we do not still forget the mute button. OK, uh, thank you very much for your report. Very informative and we will have some questions, I'm sure. But as Councillor Grant has had her hand up first, I'll pass over to Councillor Grant. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, first of all, can I thank the officers for a very full report? It's not an easy time and I think we all appreciate that. Uh, my point is a very general one and perhaps the commander could uh, uh, fill me in. Um, because we're a single police force now, whatever happens in Scotland, no matter where it is, is, is a matter for everybody to think very strongly about. The report this last week about incidents, historical incidents that happened in the Met has reverberated, I'm sure, around all police and police officers. I'm concerned about who's watching the watchers. That's the difficulty, because we are now in a situation where the least thing that is gone awry is going to be a big issue for everybody in the police, particularly in Scotland. 
So perhaps uh, Mr Sutherland is in a position to give reassurance that anything untoward will be very, very clearly looked at and nothing is going to slip by. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. <laughs> yeah, I think um, we've all been um, alert to, uh, and I'm assuming it's the, the allegations of um, police corruption within uh, the murder investigation uh, and the Metropolitan Police. And but you're absolutely right in terms of um, we very much see that actually not just with the, with the use of media and social media. Um, we saw last year how um, the murder of, of of George Floyd in America actually negatively impacted on uh, you know public trust and confidence on policing because policing is a brand, and every police force, whether it's in um, Scotland, the UK, or worldwide, we are all custodians of of policing uh, to, in, in our own way. But to bring it back to a um, a Scottish perspective, um, yeah, but there are a number of ways that we try and, and, and get around that. So first of all, um, we have our own anti-corruption uh, unit within Police Scotland, which is a dedicated team um, looking at um, potential or, or ongoing um, corruption uh, um, within Police Scotland. And within that, over the last couple of years, we've also introduced a, a thing called Safe Call, um, which allows um, actual other police officers to, to effectively um, phone in and report um, incidents of concern um, within the organisation. So we have a, a, a very robust internal process for, for, for um, making sure that, that police officers, um, not just from a corruption perspective, but from a, um, a conduct perspective, to make sure that the way that the police officers um, conduct themselves on duty and off duty is in keeping with what we would expect of Police Scotland and, and is in keeping with their um, high standards of professionalism and values. Um, and out with that, we also have um, obviously the perk, which um, Cabinet members will be familiar with in terms of um, the um, Police Investigation Review Commissioner. Uh, and also within the, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, they have a dedicated what we call Cap D, which is complaints against the police. So Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service also have their own dedicated unit to make sure that um, and, and um, where there is any form of allegation against a police officer, whether that is um, in relation to corruption or whether that is in relation to maybe an excessive use of force and assault on duty, some conduct off duty, the standards expected of police officers in Scotland is far higher uh, than it would be for a normal member of the public. And actually that would be routinely reported to Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service so that it is them that take the judgment as to the conduct of the officer and, and, and not um, within and that's not being refereed uh, within the watchers uh, as, as, as you put it. So I hope that gives you um, within that quick answer some uh, broad reassurance as to how we manage that within Police Scotland. Well I think it's not just for me Commander, it, it's for the public out there as well because uh, having heard that Massination from a few years ago is pretty frightening when you think about what can or cannot go wrong. And since we're now being directed by other forces on a day to day basis, um, nobody's in charge of their own life anymore. Um, it, it is a worry for people. To, they need to be reassured that the police are conducting themselves in an exemplary manner. And there'll be no leeway for anybody in the force. Thank you. Of course, and, and thanks to the Chief Superintendent for telling us about the range of checks and balances. I, I think one of the things that people have to realise is that we aren't living in line of duty. This is, is real life, and, and it's not like movies as such. And I'll come on to that a wee bit later. But uh, Councillor Bamforth has her hand up. Thank you, Councillor Bamforth. Thank you, Chair. Um, First, can I, can I thank the local officers for reacting both reactively and proactively um, in the current dynamic situation, which is obviously very challenging and unprecedented for all of us, all of us but obviously it presents a bigger challenge for, for yourselves on the front line. So I'd like to first thank you for, for that or thank the officers and everyone involved. I've got a few questions, if I may, and, and I'll just put my questions out there and, and you can come back. 
So the first question is, um, you mentioned that in the report there's a 140% increase in calls about public nuisance. Does this in call include calls about the incident of youth disorder in March in Clarkston that's noted elsewhere in your report, or is this in, ad in addition? Because I'm presuming you got lots of calls about that. Um, there's also a 62% in increase in neighbour dispute calls. Is this about general disputes, or, or given that we're all, you know, uh, feelings are heightened just now, or is this people, are you aware, you might not have, have this much data, but is it people reporting neighbours for breaking COVID rules? Um, in your previous reporting, you often always had data about online sexual offences, particularly about um, the sharing and, and making of online images of children and such like. And in previous reports, it has been noted that that has been um, Shown, it's shown an increase, particularly as more people are, have been working from home. There's no data in this report. I'm just wondering, is that um, what the kind of current data, if you have that, is it continuing to rise or, or is it maybe settled down now? Although no stats in that um, are, are good stats, but I just wondered what, what the current situation was. Um, and again, I'll, I'll say what I always say at every police and fire cabinet, are we doing as much as we can to encourage reporting about domestic violence? Because I'm aware um, in my role on the board of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, hospital staff are, are um, reporting a higher, uh, well, they are recording higher um, suspicions of both um, child um, and adult protection issues that are coming to the fore when people are presenting at hospitals. So I'm just wondering, you know, can 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 you reassure us that you're doing all you can to, to make sure that people are coming forward? I know we keep saying it and it's the only statistic we want to increase, not because we want incidence, incidences to increase, we want the reporting to, to increase. And lastly, it's just a comment. I'm delighted um, that you're focused and, and looking forward to the presentation in public health um, because we all know um, that's that's probably behind a lot of our, our so-called crimes. You know, there are other issues and if we can tackle and prevent some of those, hopefully some of the data and the statistics that are reported here will, will reduce. So thank you for that. Thanks, Councillor. I'll provide a couple of overview comments and then let um, Chief Inspector Gray um, comment and, and some of the more detailed ones, particularly around about uh, your, your first couple of questions. So uh, pleased to hear the early support around public health. What, what, what you will know, and, and, and as will other members, is it will take some time for that to, to begin to generate and to reduce the numbers. And quite often, quite frankly, that's why there are other police services and, and, and police areas who, who don't commit in the same way to a public health approach because it is literally turning the oil tanker in, in the sea and, and, and you will not see those quick time results in, in, in these committees in the next three months etc but it's the right thing to do it's, it's right that Police Scotland is, is a good citizen and, and is committed to those positive outcomes so, so we'll look forward to, to coming back to that next time. Your comment around about domestic abuse increase, I think that goes across a whole range of these and indeed access your comment around about online um, sexual, um, sexual abuse and, and where we are in terms of reports of that. Um, I think it's the same for domestic abuse, I think it's the same for sexual crime, uh, whether that's online or, 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 in, or in person. Um, it's always one where in, in, in one hand it's pleasing to see the number reducing, but we know it's happening and, and the more people can have the trust and confidence in, and not just policing services, because these services are delivered very much in partnership. And, you know, the chief officer group that sits at East Renfrewshire, I, I think is a very a productive and, and, and forward thinking um, chief officer group um, and, and does a great job and, and brings those range of health and social care, policing and other partners around the table to collectively provide that trust and confidence in, 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 in victims to come forward. And we know, as I said in the opening remarks, that's been a challenge through um, through through the COVID pandemic and, and absolutely with you and, and, and um, Alan and the team uh, and the public protection team have my full support in doing all that we can uh, in, in partnership to, to encourage victims of, of domestic abuse and all forms of, of crime to come forward. Um, so Alan, I'll pass over to you to maybe give a wee bit more um, round about um, the calls for public nuisance, um, the neighbour disputes uh, and whether you have the online sexual abuse figures or if that's something that we need to come back and, and, and provide. But we know certainly that that's, they have all been massively influenced by uh, COVID. Alan, thanks. 
Thank you, sir, and uh, thank you, Councillor. And yes, I will come back to you with those uh, statistics um, for for local reports around that online sexual abuse. Just opposed to to that, that we have really robust processes locally to deal with those issues, and also whether there are allegations of those issues as well, because. What we have until offences are committed is obviously potentially issues getting into the public domain um, for a suspect who may not actually be an offender. So we have to look at that wraparound protection from them and their families as well. So that's very much something that we work with locally and with our national partners. Um, in relation to public nuisance, yes, as, as I kind of um, stated in, in my initial report, public nuisance, um, that coding that we have for that within our storm command and control system has captured a whole range of additional issues. So youth disorder is captured in there and the, and the incident that you talked about specifically would be captured in that. So we have seen that huge increase in public uh, nuisance, but a big chunk of that um, over the last year um, has uh, included that those COVID breaches. However, we've compared against the previous five-year average, so that takes effectively to 2020 out of the equation and we're still slightly up on where we would normally be. I think that absolutely um, links into the issue that you mentioned there um, with, with neighbour disputes as well around the kind of reduced tolerance, um, you know, that, that COVID fatigue that has been discussed. Um, again, probably to provide reassurance, we're really active in that area with um, East Renfrewshire Council. We have a Monday grip meeting where information is shared in relation to any reports of uh, neighbour disputes, anti-social behaviour, and that links directly into our wardens um, and how that will be managed, whether you know, police can obviously deal with any offences committed, but in relation to negotiations between neighbours, if they are appropriate um, to deal with anti-social behaviour through the council. Uh, so that's something that's, that's covered every week, and we share information appropriately on that to manage those, those instances. Um, obviously, I'll come back to you in relation to the online reporting, but online reporting in general, I think, again, to capture um, the, the essence of what you were talking about in terms of our accessibility around a range of reporting measures. Um, online reporting is a matter which has been looked at by our modernised contact and engagement group uh, nationally. So we have online reporting for domestic abuse, um, for stalking and harassment uh, offences, for example, but it's not widely uh, available. There are other um, areas, hate crime being another area, where um, online reporting is promoted. Um, and again, looking at those increases in reported hate crime, has reports have uh, increased over the last few years, partly as a result of that, but also because we have uh, third-party hate uh, crime reporting centres. So we have those within um, East Renfrewshire through East Renfrewshire Disability Action and also through the uh, Glasgow Jewish Representative Council. We're also actively engaged with the, the Muslim community here uh, and representatives there, and that's an avenue we would seek to, um, to progress with them obviously if they are in agreement with, with that uh, that centre for them. But yes, that's something that we are acutely aware of. I think the in relation to reporting of domestic abuse, I think that um, proactivity that we have as well, I've, I mentioned obviously uh, some of those issues around the, the, the rigour and scrutiny that we have of those both at a local level and a greater Glasgow uh, divisional level, but also uh, proactively pro um, um, our investigations of bail conditions where domestic abuse has occurred, that in itself, uh, I think, has you know identified additional offences. So um, I think it's about absolutely supporting those victims as best we can and encouraging that. Um, and I probably, uh, I would hope you would take some reassurance from, from those comments around that, and around our, our scrutiny at a divisional level that we are providing that. Um, in terms of the, the wider public health approach, uh, I suppose just to provide some reassurance that that very much is work that is ongoing with East Renfrewshire already through our engagement um, with health and social care partners. A key factor in that is the um, a vulnerable persons database. Um, so where we identify vulnerability across that range, for, for example, if we have a missing person, um, whether that be a child um, or an elderly person, um, where we identify uh, dementia-related conditions in all cases of domestic abuse and identifying where children um, are involved in that relationship, um, those are submitted through the, um, the, the concern hub that the, the, um, the vulnerable uh, persons data report is actually the catalyst for that. 
that is considered by our concern hub for sharing with partners. So that is a direct link. And again, that's a key area when we're looking at that public health approach to instances of near fatal overdose um, uh, with drug addictions. That is a catalyst for starting that process to get the support uh, from uh, those appropriate agencies to that individual as quickly as possible. So, uh, so those processes um, are already in place. Um, and that engagement at kind of tactical and strategic level within East Renfrewshire around the alcohol and drugs partnership um, around issues such as mental health um, and suicide prevention, those are all ongoing matters um, and obviously um, will be highlighted through um, the commander's uh, public health approach that he detailed. So um, I think hopefully that covers the, the, the points that you raised, uh, Councillor Bamford. I will come back to you in relation to that online fence. Were there any issues that, I, that you'd have further questions on? No, that's great. Thank you for that. And I look forward to seeing the, the, the figures. Well, I don't look forward to it because actually I would rather there weren't any figures, but, you know, it'll be interesting to see what, what, what has happened um, and whether it's still escalating or whether it's levelled off. But thank you for that information. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Buchanan. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks, folks. Uh, thanks, Alan and Mark, for the, the comprehensive report. Uh, there are some good things in it, and, and clearly there are equally some, some, some signs for concern. I think Councillor Grant raised a very valid point uh, in, in her first comment about how the police force is viewed, uh, because that integrity uh, and fairness and respect that we talk about uh, is, is vital, especially when you're looking at circumstances whereby we're policing, hopefully by consent and on a consensual basis, uh, and looking across the board. So to have that trust in our police force is vital. And I think it's important that that message goes out, uh, that there is scrutiny, that there is governance, uh, and uh, any wrongdoing on any part will be brought uh, to justice if at all possible, because I think it's important that the public have that trust in our police service. And I think that's a very valid point that was made. Touching on the other issues, I think we know that the lockdown has created a set of circumstances which is, is very different for everyone and, and certainly not uh, easy to police by any manner of means because of the very nature of it. Yeah. Uh, we know that we have seen increased antisocial nuisance calls, um, be, primarily I suspect because of the frustrations that people feel uh, because of lockdown, feeling almost confined uh, to their properties in many ways, uh, perhaps becoming much more territorial in that respect. And the, the, the nuisance aspect, uh, things that would perhaps previously have been overlooked, uh, are now becoming a, a much bigger issue and leading to many more disputes uh, with neighbours than would, you know, perhaps normally or in other circumstances be the case. But I think it's vital that we're seen to be tackling those issues because they are concerns that the public have. And it's therefore important that in conjunction with yourselves and indeed our warden services, that we are seen to be doing uh, everything we can to not only mediate, but to tackle uh, the aspects that people are perceiving to be an issue. Um, because I think that's going to be an issue uh, certainly over the next few months, certainly probably over the summer period. And as restrictions begin to ease, it may become a, very much uh, a bigger hot topic in how we manage these things. Uh, out with that, I think the report is generally good. Councillor Bamford touched on some of the areas of concern. We, we know that the difficulties of lockdown may well have reduced the numbers of calls that we get in terms of things like domestic violence or abuse, etc. And that's something that uh, I'm sure you'll be keeping uh, an eye on uh, to ensure that people feel free um, to make to contact yourselves, to contact any individual should they be feeling uh, under stress in, in that way. So I think there is a whole lot of things going on that uh, hasn't been helped by the pandemic. It has given us new things to look at, perhaps created circumstances uh, which we otherwise wouldn't be in. But I think it's important that you're seen uh, to be as effective as possible in dealing with those issues because it's, it, it's there that public trust will be garnered. Uh, and that's vitally important going forward. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Buchanan. OK, I see no more hands up, so I, I just want to say a couple of make a couple of points and I do have a question, at least one question at the end of it. 
Uh, it's a very, it's a positive report and it's it comprehensive and it, and it tells us a, a whole story. There's some uh, particularly nasty crimes in there and, and officers exposed to traumatic events, but yet reporting for duty the next day. So, so I want to talk and thanks to all the police force and, and the people on the ground as well as yourselves for, for managing this. Uh, one of the things that runs the whole way through the report, which is always pleasing for me, is this partnership theme. theme. I know Alan has been quickly in about and, and built relationships within the council, and, and that's that's the way forward. That that's always been the way around East Strand for sure, and, and that we continue to do that. Uh, we talked about the summer ahead, and we're going to do the messaging from the schools, joined up with yourselves, joined up with the fire service. All that that joining up the the part of that I've always said it's not like when you have two partners it's not like three plus three it's like three multiplied by three and the more you add into that the stronger that becomes. Uh, we heard about uh, policing by consent. Uh, there is no other real way of doing it. I don't think uh, uh, that's a problem. Obviously, uh, uh, well, well, it takes that public health approach. We look forward to that and the. The three E's and maybe the fourth one if we need it, you know. So hopefully engaging, explaining, and encouraging means we we uh, don't have to move to enforcement. But when that has to happen, then that has to happen. So yeah, thank you very much for the uh, positive report. And the other point I wanted to well, one of the other points was that the bit on the bottom of, of your report. I think Councillor Buchanan and Councillor Grant we've all sort of touched on this. It's not just tackling crime; it's about the fear of crime around here sometimes, you know, where there is no crime, but people are anxious about it. It's how they feel, how they feel safe. And that's about the trust elements that we had there that we talked about. The thing I wanted to talk about, or I wanted to ask a question about, was an aspect of violent crime. And I noticed that 10% are assaults on emergency workers. I don't know how that breaks up between ambulance, police, fire service, but I wondered what you might be doing about that. And we've heard about taser consultations and the body cam consultations. Our own community wardens were uh, body cams. So I, I just wanted to explore, is that some a way that you're going to try to deter assaults on people in general, but particularly on emergency workers who are turning up to help folk in, in distress or whatever, and and, and the risk of yeah. violence? Thanks, Chair. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we have um, through, you know, I fully support the chief constable's pledge and and and, and a kind of um, under the banner that we call your safety matters, which is our commitment internally to try and support our own officers who are victims uh, victims of assault. Uh, we do find within that 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 ten percent, the large majority um, are, are are police officers. Um, although we do have some some fire and ambulance colleagues in there who who we support um, as as best we can. Um, I agree with you entirely that the, the advantages of body worn video um, will be significant in this regard, in this regard, um, and that it will bring to life in a criminal justice setting um, some of the you know you know it will tell the story of what that assault looked like for that officer and 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 how traumatic it, it can be, um, but but it should also reduce um, and I think it will influence the conduct of of. Um, some members of the public and a very small minority, I have to say, uh, members of the public um, who um, are aggressive and, uh, and towards our staff and, and, and inflict these assaults. So it may well prevent some of that. We do know that body worn video it does um, have a, a prevention um, aspect to it, which is positive. And similarly, it might also reduce some pressures on the criminal justice system because we also know that body worn video leads to earlier guilty pleas through the criminal justice system because the evidence is is, is clear and, and is visible to see and, and there is no rather than just res responding to a, a written report. Um, so I'm very grateful as always for, for yourself chairing the support from, from the cabinet round about the, um, the level of, of violence and exposure that our officers um, um, faced with. Um, what we do now have is a, a, a measure in place to monitor particularly those officers who are becoming repeat victims of whether that's violence or verbal abuse so that we have effectively a mechanism to provide additional welfare and support for those officers as well as the routine day-to-day -day, uh, welfare monitoring that Alan will oversee locally within East Renfrewshire and I know that where an officer is injured or 
because under a particularly challenging um, event, um, Alan and, and Michelle will reach out to that officer directly and make sure that welfare vet is there. But at a more strategic level, we have a, a process in place to, to, to manage that. And as you say, hopefully the body worn video um, will, will, will provide some additional um, support for our officers in that regard. Um, Alan, is there anything else you would want to add from that to that on a local perspective? So just picking up on the uh, the issue the chair raised in relation to um, fear of crime, um, I'd, I'm unashamedly going to plug here, and I know I have with some of the councillors already following our um, at East Rain Police social media feed. Um, if I if I go back to the the um, you know that that summer period and the parks and open spaces um, and, and more people using them and, and wishing to promote that safe use of those spaces for all, which is very much the focus of the Safe East Rain Group and that summer plan. If I go back to the, the, the sad um, um, report in relation to Save Everard um, and the Met, and we look at the um, you know lone female and open spaces, and that was very much you know, a discussion with our uh, Violence Against Women partnership colleagues, um, we put out a lot of pro, uh, a proactive, positive messaging around the use of, for example, our mounted branch officers, our um, local problem solving teams officers, the, the use of the drone, which I, um, I know that was supported by, by councillors. And that was, it's actually, um, social media is not the be all and end all, um, absolutely not, but it's a very good tool for us to get that message. We have uh, a decent following and it does actually, when we looked at the drone um, uh, messaging, very positively received. Um, and it was retweeted by a lot of the councillors, which really helped. Um, so I would please encourage uh, where, where possible, because it does have an impact. We, we, we see an increase in that, but it's a means of us getting that positive message now that we do have a safe place. You know, um, if we look at the, the crime statistics that we have, East Renfrewshire is um, a safe place to, to, to live and work. And, um, and we want to do everything we can to support that with our partners. But, but that promotion um, did seem to uh, provide that reassurance that, that I know a number of councillors have obviously mentioned here today. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think the, the police feed has a, an extra gravitas to it. People people believe what comes from the police feed in general, which is good. OK, does anybody else have any more questions? No. OK, thank you very much for your reports and uh, have a happy, safe summer. And we're going to move on to Scottish Fire Rescue Service on to Alan for the SFRS report, please. Thank you, Chair, and good morning. Um, good morning to everybody else. Um, Chair, firstly, if I could just provide an update on some personnel movements uh, within our East Renfrewshire sector. So Area Commander Jim McNeil um, has moved on to Pastures New and he's taken up a new post in Northumberland Fire and Rescue Service, uh, which he started on Monday morning. And our new area commander, who's been appointed on a temporary basis, is area commander David Macari, um, which I'm really pleased to say David already works within our sector, um, very knowledgeable about the area, has been there for several years, and really welcome him into the new post and looking forward to working with him. So David will be at our next meeting, and no doubt he'll be engaging with, with, with yourselves, councillors, um, and the chief exec as we move forward. So just, just for the update for the record there, um, I also have a couple of updates from the last meeting, which I did not attend. Um, I think one was for Councillor Bamford with regards to unwanted fire alarm signals and a breakdown on where they have um, where they have been. And also one for yourself, Chair, um, which is on the new link detectors and the legislation surrounding that. So if you're happy with that, Chair, I'll provide that once I've completed the report. Thanks. Um, so I'll now go through our um, East Renfrewshire performance report for the period January 1st, 21st to March 31st, uh, 21. So as a service, we continue in a positive manner with our resilience remaining high uh, and our COVID security intact. Uh, we're continuing to meet with the challenges of that on a day-to-day -day basis. However, it's not affect affecting our ability to respond uh, and we're, we're continuing in a positive vein with that. So overall, we've had another positive report for East Renfrewshire against their key priorities. Um, with any increases that we are noting, they're based on low numbers and they've been met with the appropriate demand reduction strategies as and when we encounter them. Um, I'll run through the summary first of all. So overall, our fires, our total instance, um, are up by 3%. Our fires primary and secondary are up by 7%, but taking into account that this is during the period of grass fire season, 
um, which traditionally will rise. So a 7% increase marked against that is, is, is not as big as, as what it may seem. Um, special services are up 16% and can be mainly accounted for by assisting other agencies, for example, Scottish Ambulance Service and entering premises to assist with casualties. Um, as you'll see, our fire and non-fire casualties have a significant reduction, which I'm really pleased to see. Our false alarms are down by 1%. Um, and uh, the economic cost of UFAS, which I'll, I'll discuss further as we go through the report, um, is sitting at £102,440. Um, so moving on to our first section, um, which is accidental dwelling fires, you'll note there a significant drop on the year-on-year -year and the three-year average. So we've had 11 for this period, 27% uh, drop on the year-on-year -year average and 25% um, drop on the three-year average. So in, in areas where we have had um, an increase, the crews have carried out targeted leaflet drops um, in these specific areas, and we've actually carried these out to any instance where we've had one or more accidental dwelling fire callouts uh, within that area. So this is working effectively, and it's, it's, it's certainly having a significant impact on the reduction strategy. Um, our ADF casualties, um, as you will see there, we have had... Um, Two on there. One is a fatality. Um, the first multi-agency uh, case conference has taken place regarding this, and investigations are ongoing, um, with a further multi-agency meeting to follow. And the second casualty was at the same incident, with the injuries being slight burns to the hands of a neighbour who assisted, uh, and first aid was rendered at the scene by Scottish Ambulance Service. So a nasty one that, and one that's ongoing just now, and as I'm sure police colleagues will support me with, there's ongoing investigations into that just now. Um, so, moving on now to our unintentional injury and harm. So, again, 75% reduction on that there, which is significant, and a 36% reduction on the, the, the three-year average. So, it's, it's pleasing to note that um, the, the unintentional harm has not involved any RTCs or water rescue incidents. Um, as Alan mentioned earlier, you know, we've, we've got ongoing work just now round about the reservoir and uh, that, this will continue to go and it's pleasing to see that we've, we've had nothing come from that so far. Um, and the main, th th these are normally the kind of main contributory factors to these, these type of incidents and uh, as I say, we're in a good position just now. Um, so moving on to deliberate fire setting. So deliberate fire setting, um, there's been an increase in the year-in-year -year indicator and the three-year average with the highest percentage of deliberate fires being of a secondary nature involving refuse. So a high percentage of these can be attributed to a spike at the stables, um, Boylston Road, Barhead, and in the Moorland at Ferenese Golf Club. And that was between the period of the 17th of the 2nd and uh, the, the 21st of the 2nd. Um, our CAT team have been fully engaged with all premises relative to this area uh, to advise the dangers involved and to remove any potential sources of ignition. Uh, they've also engaged with the community wardens and police colleagues to increase patrols within the area. And to date, this has stopped this spike of activity. So hopefully we'll continue in the same vein as we, as we move forward. Um, moving on to non-domestic fire safety. Uh, you'll note there's been a significant reduction in both indicators against figures which are, are already um, historically have been low, with one incident being um, deliberate at a barn fire in Boylston Road and one accidental at a council office um, in Rook and Glen, which had a suspected electrical fault. And thankfully, no firefighting action was required um, at that instant. Um, th these, are, these are still very low numbers, and I'm pleased to see that. Um, the derelict premises, which was the barn, and the other being a council premises, um, the link to land raised awareness to this, and no damage was done to the property. So again, having the link to land and early intervention from us um, saved further damage to the premises. So... Really pleased to see that. Um, moving on to unwanted fire alarm signals. So as you can see here, year on year average, we've had a reduction of 40% there. Um, and under three, a three year average is 5%. Um, UFAS has been a reduction on uh, across the board there. And while it still has a significant even up impact, the reduction has taken place with both, most, most businesses, care homes and sheltered housing being back to full operational capacity. So that, that's really positive to see. And, and during this period, we have run a campaign um, which is called the Take Five campaign. 
and it's based on a, a campaign that was run by the NHS some time ago, and we've adapted it to suit. So we have this across social media, social media in East Remshire Council and our own. Um, and what happens is each of the appliances, when they get out an unwanted fire alarm signal, they will address the situation when they're there. So they'll provide guidance, they'll provide literature, and it will be registered, and then it will be recorded, and we will then review that. So to date, any instance that we've went to where we have provided the Take 5 campaign, we have no further instance of reoccurrence there. So that's um, that's really pleasing to see. Um, if I could move on now, Chair, if you're quite happy, um, just to give feedback to Councillor Bamford and also to yourself. So um, a breakdown on our UFAS for Councillor Bamford was that we had 52 incidents over the, the, the period here from the 1st of January to 31st of March. Um, we had 18 within educational premises, um, 11 within residential homes, six within hotels and retail, and all other activations were individual premises. So again, as I've discussed with the Take 5 campaign, as soon as the crews go out there, they engage with them, and that is now monitored. So if we have a reoccurrence there, then we're starting, we're starting immediately to look into that to find out what's causing the problem, because local engagement and immediate engagement should be resolving that at source and we'll continue to work along that, but very, very positive outcomes from that um, where we are just now. We're also in the process of planning to undertake a public consultation in relation to our automatic fire alarm response, and this is scheduled to take place in mid-July. Um, so if, if the chair is happy, I will pass on the link to send out to everybody to get feedback on that. I'll allow you access to all the literature, and uh, please feel free to circulate it to any of your teams, and we'd welcome any feedback from that. Um, yep, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I was just, excuse me, but yes, please, for the link. All right, right. For the link. Um, and for yourself, Chair, if you're happy, I can provide you with a, an update on the, the new link detectors. Um, so the new legislation will come into play in February 2022, um, and it will be for all domestic premises. Um, with all new homes having this fitted as a, a standard asset within within the new builds, um, our operational crews are undertaking training and installation on the wire, wireless equipment at the present. Um, and, and currently, we have our crews within East Renfrewshire um, trained up in these. They'll get refresher training nearer the time, just as a, a, a boost prior to going out and starting to fit the alarms. Um, the alarms will consist of one smoke alarm, uh, which will be fitted in the most frequently used room one smoke alarm in every other circulation space. So for example, in the hallways, uh, landings, etc. One heat alarm in the kitchen and one carbon monoxide detector where there's a carbon fueled appliance. So we will be supplying these link detectors as per the new legislation to our highest risk premises only, or premises where we discover that they have no detection to make sure we leave them in a, in a safe position. Um, so while we're carrying out our home fire safety visits, whether, whether we're responding to operational incidents, post-domestic incident responses, if we identify anybody who would be deemed as high risk, or in fact they have no detection within their premises, we will fit that while we're there, and we'll carry this equipment on our fire appliances. Um, this will be seven days a week, and we'll have backup supplies in all our stations. Um, the private landlords have a legal, legal obligation to provide this for their tenants, um, because that's the level of protection that's required, and that's the, as a duty holder, they have a duty of care to provide that. However, if we are going out and we're, in, we're, we're coming across any premises where we find that that has not been fitted, we will fit our detection system in place to ensure that the people are left safe, and then we'll go through the appropriate measures to report that. So, Chair, that concludes um, report. Sorry, did I go into mute there? You, you, you put yeah. yourself on mute. Sorry there. Um, so that, that concludes the report, and more than happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for that, Alan. So, uh, Councillor Grant has got her hand up for a question. Um, yes, I'm sorry, I missed the very beginning, Alan, of of your of your last comments uh, because my phone rang. But anyway, the, can you tell me where where are we with the business of uh, putting in sprinkler systems? into new build. Uh, did I miss that or have we never quite got to that? I remember no, we, years, ago, years ago we were talking about it. Are we there? Yeah, no, we're, we're not there yet, Councillor. The, the expense of fitting uh, sprinkler systems into all new builds outweighs 
um, any, any potential for them to go in. So within commercial premises, etc., we would fill, we would fit um, sprinkler systems. That's part of fire safety legislation. But within domestic premises, it would only be fitted in, uh, for example, within the care sector. However, there are also um, retrofit systems and portable systems. So, for example, if we were identifying someone, I've been involved in a few cases of this myself, so where individuals were self-harming within the home, had the potential to set themselves on fire, or were in fact in an environment where um, they had the potential to cause risk to other people within the, 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 the premises that they lived in, then a, a temporary or a fixed installation system can be fitted within there, along with other um, preventative measures, for example, um, fire retardant bedding, matting, um, sensor impairment alarms, different things like that. But, but as a standard practice, um, no, the, the, the expense outweighs uh, the need for it just now. So there, there, there's certainly nothing in there just now to, to start putting that into domestic premises. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK, Councillor Bamforth. Thank you, Chair. And, and thanks, uh, Mr. Cockty, for all the information. And some of the stats are very pleasing to see about the reductions. Um, I've got a couple of questions. So again, if I can just give you the questions first. Um, yeah. In page 10, you, you, you touched on the, the special services, the increase in the pictures of cars. I'm just wondering, and you mentioned it was about assisting other services. I'm just wondering what kind of incidents you would have been called to for that, given that this is between January and March, when again we were in virtual full lockdown. So like cars on the road in particular should have been reduced. So I'm just curious as to know what kind of things would you assist with? Um, the other question I have is on page 12, and you've touched on it again, about alarms raised um, via linked systems, and 91% of those were, were people um, um, with these linked systems, which is, um, uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful that we're detecting these and, and we're doing this very proactively and preventing um, issues getting out of hand. But I just wondered, and, and I'm, I'm sure you do, but I just want um, reassurance. In those situations, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of these people will be um, our elderly population. Um, so if, if this is happening um, either frequently with one person or if you have concerns with one person, do you speak to social workers and things about, um, I know often, and I have seen it with my own mother who has dementia, quite often the, they will disable um, the cooker so that, the, that this can happen again or or perhaps it's maybe not appropriate for them to be using cooking appliances so i, I just wondered what your um uh, cross uh, multi-agency working with around that was and what kind of um feedback and, and give you give about that uh, in terms of and thank you for the data on new fast that's that's good um, and the last thing you mentioned was about this new legislation in february 22 and i was asked um a, a few months ago by one of the community councils about who would enforce this and um i believe that the council will be responsible for obviously um looking at private landlords and our own properties but in terms of um in terms of private householders, um, apparently the fire brigade have um, the, the powers to enforce that. And I just wonder how, how you will manage that. That seems quite an onerous um, an onerous responsibility to, to I, I don't know what, what you do. Is it if you go out to fire and a private householder doesn't have these, what, what do they mean by enforcement, which is in the legislation? It particularly mentions enforcement. And um, are, are the fire brigade doing any kind of um, proactive advertising of this to inform all householders or is that will that be a government um, campaign just to let all householders know what they need to do to comply with this reg legislation which February 22 isn't that far away um, no. so if you could answer those please yep absolutely councillor thank you for that um, so First of all, for your first question, assisting agencies. So predominantly that comes down now and, and it's something that we're actively involved in and want to be involved in. So if we have an elderly person who may have fell within the house and activated their linked alarm and uh, the ambulance service have been called out to it, the ambulance service don't carry tools for to gain entry to that premise. Um, as I'm sure we all know, elderly people they, they try and get to the door, as we all would do, and try and escape, try and get out of the premises and, and, and make somebody aware that something's happening to them. And quite often they fall behind the door 
or they fall behind the toilet door and they're trapped within the premises. So us, us as an organisation have the capabilities then very quickly to get to the premises, sometimes in front of the ambulance service, and we can get there and, and enter into the property and provide initial help until the, the ambulance service come. So that's predominantly what takes up assisting other agencies. Um, I, I'm, I'm pleased to see it's, it's a very positive one for us because if we are getting called out to these, um, sometimes we can be you know next door to where these people are and the ambulance service are really, really busy just now. And if we can be in there and provide initial care until the specialists come, then that, to, to me, that's a positive for us. So the, the more of these we get, you know, I think that's a very positive thing. So whilst it ups our figures, it's not up in our figures in the realms of road traffic collisions and the things that we try to drive down. So it's, so it's a positive there. Um, in terms of the, the, the second one, so the alarm systems. Um, alarm systems are, are, are normal activations are caused by, it could be, you know, children within the schools, it could be elderly people. And, and as I spoke about with the, with the Take 5 campaign and also our Be Aware campaigns, it's about driving them down to the initial source. So when our crews go out, it may be something as simple as putting a protective cover. If, if an elderly person who has dementia or has um, Alzheimer's or whatever, you know, as as they, they get into the habit of maybe hitting that same call point, then a simple cover over that, they can still hit the call point, but it doesn't activate it. We should be discussing that with them. And I'm very, very, very focused on making sure that my crews at every one of these events go out, talk to them, and they make sure that you know, for, for, for a, a few pounds, we can put a cover on that and we can remove that. We can have the call point removed. If it's in a domestic premise, as you rightly said, councillor, um, I've been involved in several um, cases where we've had to put specific shut-off valves for a gas cooker or an electric cooker. And you can put them in a, an area where only the, 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 the individual's family can come in and access them. So that they still have the ability to, to get some kind of form of cooking within the premises. However, that would be controlled by the family and that would be conducted by a case conference which would be held between ourselves and all relevant parties. So if that needed to be police, social work, occupational therapists, uh, the family, very important that they're involved and we would sit down and ultimately, um, as opposed to taking away what, what would probably be some of the last most enjoyable things to these people, we try and put it in place in, in a controlled manner so as we can minimise the opportunity for there to be damage to themselves primarily and to be any, anybody else that, that, that they're involved with or live within the same premises. So, so we do that. There's also smart technology, movement technology that can be fitted within the houses. So if they're leaving the houses, if they're going into areas that they shouldn't be, that's notified and it goes back through the risk management centre. So there's, there's various ways of achieving that, but ultimately it needs to be done through a coordinated and controlled approach with everybody involved so as we have the full information, and then it's monitored after that. Um, and your third question with regards to the legislation. So we, we have fire safety legislation for premises which are classed as relevant premises. Um, however, a private premise owner, which is something completely different. So if I own, I own my own property, it will be my responsibility to make sure that my premises is fitted with a linked smoke detection system. And there will be media campaigns coming up um, we, we will be running our own as well in support of the, the, the government legislation, but primarily that will come out through the Scottish Government. Um, the, in, in terms of us being able to enforce it, if we go to a private landlord and they don't have it, as opposed to leaving them unprotected, um, we, we will fit a system when we're in there exactly the same as we do just now. But the responsibility will lie with the private tenant. For a private landlord, it's a totally different thing, and that will be reported through the Private Landlords Association, which is attached to the council, as you know and that will be highlighted. So we may have landlords who have 10, 20, 30 premises, and um, we may come across one of those, but identifying that they haven't got the appropriate measures put in place, therefore they're breaching legislation and their duty of care as a, as, as a duty holder, then we will highlight, highlight that through the, the Private Landlords Association, and the people will then be taken to task for that. Um, th th that's one that sits very strongly with me, and the reason being that we have a lot of people who's vulnerable that um, take up residency within these premises and they're absolutely entitled to the same level of safety as everybody else within our communities. And that will set, certainly be a priority target for our community action teams to identify those people that are most vulnerable within the communities. So is that, uh, hopefully that will answer your questions, Councillor. Thank you. The only thing is about private individuals, you know, if it is legislation, um, and they're not complying and you go out um, and someone doesn't have these link detectors, 
Well, yep. Do you report it to someone? I mean, I'm not saying everything should be reported to police, but I'm just wondering if the legislation says that the, the fire brigade have a responsibility for that. Who, who would you report that to? Obviously, the landlords are talking about reporting to local authorities yep. and things. If an individual doesn't have it, do you do the same thing? Do you fit the detectors well, and then report it to someone? We, we would make a report on it, but the, the, it would lie with the individual and their insurance within their premises. So their insurance within their premises would dictate that they would need to have that to cover their contents within their premises. So it would be full hard of them not, not, not to have it. We would obviously highlight our concerns. If we went in and, for example, it was a semi-detached premise or a mid-terrace premise where there may be an impact on other individuals within there, we would then look to progress that to provide safety for other people within those premises. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for that, Alan. And Councillor Bamforth. Does anybody else have any other questions? I, I have one, but I'll wait till the end. <laughs> OK, uh, Alan, thanks very much for the report and thanks for getting back to us about the detectors in the homes and so on. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's very informative. And your report is very informative also again. Uh, I wanted to ask a couple of things, actually. So the grassland fires, everybody knows we have a climate emergency at the minute and it is getting hotter and we're going to talk more about that. We're going to talk for the rest of the year about that, uh, but we still can. And uh, th that's bound to increase pressure upon yourselves. I don't know if you're starting to plan up for that, but the, the more specific thing I wanted to ask was about the deliberate fire setting. What, what do we do? What can you do to try to deter that? What, what actions are being taken for that? Uh, so th thanks for that, Chair. Um, so firstly, absolutely, climate change um, and very much weather related is dependent upon our activity and kind of a huge constraint upon our budget and our resources. Um, so each year prior to it happening, we're engaging with the, the, the known areas where we get this activity because through our, our data, we can predict very quickly where we're going to get it. And a lot of it come off of muir burning and different things in the past, where it's a traditional, um, certainly from the, the area I come from originally in Ayrshire, um, if I go towards, you know, the Domellington area, etc., it was known as a traditional thing. And um, it, it, we had to do a lot of engagement with actual parents as opposed to the kids, because the, the, the parents just kind of thought, you know, that's one of the things that the kids have done for years. So the engagement part had to come with the parents to let them realise the, the social and economic impact on that. Um, and in our area in East Renfrewshire, we don't have the same problem, but we have the same we have the same problem, but within certain areas. Um, and it becomes a you know they like to see the fire engines coming out and putting the fires out. So it's about initial engagement with the schools. That's been limited this year with, with, with COVID etc. But it's about getting in there and speaking to the schools and letting them know because it's it's not just about the impact on the on us getting out there, but the likes of the animals. You know. There, there, there's, there's, there's several hundred different species of animals within these areas who are buried in small holes. And as the fire rushes over the top and draws the oxygen out, it kills all of these. It's got the potential to, to, to move more importantly into to bigger buildings, into domestic premises, etc. So it, it's total about education. And we take that through our thematic action plans, which we introduce prior to that season every year. And that goes through the schools, through going into youth clubs, through youth engagement, uh, through tying in with our partner agencies. And getting the message out there, and, um, and 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 we'll continue to do that as we move forward um, by attending the, the the local groups that we attend, and predominantly through our local authority uh, liaison officer, our Lalo, and his coordination of our community action team. Oh, you're on mute, Chair. Again, it's the partnership approach that that works uh, absolutely. best. Absolutely. Uh, the support chair of the of the partners, having police colleagues on board, having the wardens on board in the specific areas, um, and, and and engaging with it, with the youths that are there and trying to remove it. We're, we're very fortunate in East Renfrewshire and other areas I've worked. When you when you try to engage in some of these areas, um, the, the the kickback from it can often be violent. You know, acts of violence against their personnel, as as police colleagues spoke about earlier. Um, and, and, and we're very fortunate in our area. We don't see a big instance of that. Normally, when we arrive, they disperse and away they go. Um, the issue is that they will come back. Some of the tactics we'll use is, if it's a larger area, we'll empty a tank right onto the whole area so as they kind of reignite it. Um, there's small things like that we can do, but the small gains, you know, total up and reduce the amount of incidents and the amount of opportunity. 
for it to, to, to become a bigger incident, if you like. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody for any more? Uh, no? Okay. Thank you very much, Phil. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, you, very Phil. comprehensive reports. That was a good meeting. Uh, we, we got a lot of information there. And uh, like I said, uh, I hope we have a, everybody has a nice, safe summer. And I hope the weather is as good as it is today on Buzzwing. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, thanks.